the book. Great. We are continuing the look at our book. Um, it's called Strength of a Woman, Why You Are, Proverbs 31. Let me clear my screen real quick. Uh, this is the book we're reading from, but um, we're going through it oh so slowly. Um, I'm going to actually try to do three chapters this week. I, I looked at it and I thought, you know, if we just do two chapters a week or a month, it's going to be... Um, It'll be like next year before we finish the book because there's 22 chapters. So we're gonna we're gonna try to pick it up just a tiny bit. I promise you they're not hard chapters. Um, and I'm sure some of you guys have read ahead anyway because it's hard to not read a book <laughs> as you get into the flow of things. Hey guys, I see a few of you jumping in on the chat as well. I'm gonna put the chat over here so I can hear it. Listen, as I'm talking, I kind of get in the zone, like I'm in the teaching zone, but please um, feel free to unmute, talk, chat, um, put questions in the sidebar. If you guys are reading along, you are so welcome to share anything in the book that um, that you enjoyed as well. You know, I want to hear those things. So this is an interactive class. <laughs> it's not just me talking. But um, today we're going to continue through Proverbs 31. Um, if you guys are just joining us, um, this is the first time you've ever heard about this book or anything. Proverbs 31 is actually an acrostic poem of the Hebrew alphabet. And so when I wrote the book, I, I am the author. When I wrote the book, I discovered that that was something I never knew. And um, I also began to understand that the Hebrew letters have images behind it. There, It's a pictographic language. And so these images um, help memorization, which that's what an acrostic poem is for. But the, the images and, and all the figurative language that is packed into those images shows up in the verses um, in Hebrew. And we miss some of that when we read it in English as it's been translated. So I'm going to read to you the three verses that we're going to cover today. I'll tell you the letters that we're going to talk about and how they apply to these verses. So I'm reading out of the NASB version. Um, of my Bible. So this is Proverbs 31, and we're going to do 12, 13, and 14 today, hopefully. Okay, she does him good and not evil all the days of her life. She looks for wool and flax and works with her hands in delight. She's like a merchant ship. She's like a merchant ship, and she brings food from afar. So how does that apply to me? Um, also, I want you just to kind of keep this in the back of your mind. Um, how does it apply to us as believers and how does it re um, reveal Yeshua, Messiah? Um, that's what we should really be asking ourselves, especially when we read the Old Testament, like how, how is this revealing Messiah? Um, and how does it apply to me if I'm not married or if I'm widowed or divorced or no children, any of the above? Because this is um, this is a passage in the Bible that applies to us whether uh, we're we're married or not. Honestly, yes, it's um, advice to the uh, from the mother to a son and what kind of wife he should look for. But really, it's a description of womanhood, biblical womanhood. So um, I'm going to start with Proverbs 31:12, and this is the one that says. She does some good and not evil all the days of her life. Now, this verse starts with the letter uh, Gimel. And Gimel has, um, it's one of my favorite. It has the image of a camel. It's where we actually get the word camel from. And it's the first word of this verse in Hebrew is actually benefit. Like she is a benefit. And so if we look at the passage, we've got Aleph means we're yoked together. And Beit is we're building a home. And now Gimel is how it reveals how she is a benefit for her family. And so think about a camel for a minute. Um, and I'm not going to go over everything in the book, but I just kind of want to hit some high points. You know, um, if you were in the ancient Near East and you lived in Israel, um, it, isn't it a benefit to have a camel, right? Not everybody had a camel, but think about the trade routes and the travel that we had that would you know be done between even cities, the, the amount of walking that they did. So if you had um, a beast of burden, like a camel or a donkey, um, that was a great benefit to have that. Um, and think about how camels kind of move and operate, right? 
they have to they have to kneel down. So they're they're kneeling and kind of bowing before you before um, you can load anything on their backs. And so yeah, and you have to unload anything that may already be there. And so how does that relate to us as being great benefits to our family? Now, yes, and this probably isn't very attractive, but aren't we kind of beasts of burden for our um, for our families? Um, don't we carry a lot? Don't we um, help them navigate through wildernesses, you know, the times of wilderness in their life? Um, think about the hump on a camel's back. It's a, it's a bridge. And don't we bridge the distance sometimes um, for our families? The person that I wrote about um, acts as a bridge. And I think if, if you guys didn't join us earlier this morning, uh, Sarita, Ruth, and I had a great, great conversation of how we kind of act like a gimmel between um, our, our family who is Torah observant and our family who's not Torah observant or, um, you know, the, the, the circles that we travel in. Um, I still attend a traditional church because my husband is not Torah observant. But I want to be that bridge, right? And my my children, um, you know, I ra I raised them in a Christian home, but it was way prior uh, before I really became much more Torah observant and um, Hebrew inclined. And so I have to act as that bridge, right? I have to show them the benefits of living a life um, that is Torah observant. So think about that and how we as a body of believers can can be that for those who are not um, as familiar with the scriptures. Um, we spend a lot of time reading scripture. And so I think that you can be a great benefit to those around you. So I wanted to share that a little bit about Gimel. So she is a great benefit. So you, you are great benefits to your family, um, but just be sure that you're using it in such a way that you're acting as a bridge. To, to bring others to Yeshua. The next verse is, um, she looks for wool and flax and works well with her hands in delight. So this is a section, um, if you look at Proverbs 31, it's actually sectioned off, it's in chunks. So the first three verses, which is Aleph, Beit, and Gimel, those are the establishment, really the establishment of a home, correct? right? You're yoked together, you build a home and you become the benefits, you benefit each other. Well, now you have to face the world and you do that by leaving the door, right? You have to leave the door of your home and go out into the world. And so this passage, she looks for wool and flax, works well with her hands um, with delight. It actually starts with the letter Dalit and um, it's in the word Daresh. And there's a really interesting little bit of a play on words here. Now, I'm, I might have mentioned before in previous classes that uh, Proverbs 31 has two very strong themes. One is military. You'd be surprised. There's like a ton of words in here that, that relate to the military. And the other one is um, the priest or the tabernacle being a priest. And this is one of the verses that really discusses the, the imagery of the priest, the priestly duties. Um, so think about, yep, Dalit is the door. So we have to leave the door to our homes and we have to encounter the world. We have to encounter creation. And so what better way to do that than to truly live a life of separation, right? We are in the world. We're not of the world and think about wool and flax. Like, what do you guys know about wool and wool and linen? Well, we'll call it that because that's actually what linen uh, linen is made out of flax. So, what do you guys know about wool and linen? Um, I'll pause for a second and see if you guys can pick up on it relating to the priestly duties. Well, that'll be your clue. They cannot be mixed, right? And so now maybe you can see a little bit how like I'm in the world, I'm not of the world, I can't mix with the world. Um, wool is an image that usually represents the flesh, right? Um, but also wool has a very soothing um, lanolin, you know, the lanolin from wool, if you touch it, it's kind of got that little grease to it. It's very soothing. Lax is um, very hard, it's a plant. And 
you have to beat it down. Um, and it's, it's really worked hard, but when that happens, it's hard on your hands, right? So it's really stiff and scratchy and, you know, very difficult to handle. And then wool is like that soothing, um, you know, the soothing lanolin. So we've got flesh and then we've got, um, holiness, right? Linen, the linens of holiness and linen. If you think about linen, if you guys wear linen, you know, that's a softer material, but it's, it's only soft because it's just been used and worked and, and definitely, um, you know, put through the, the loom of weaving. And so we've got an image of separation and the word Duresh, where it says that she, um, she looks for wool and flax. If you look that word up in the um, Blue Letter Bible and kind of do a little bit of a word study on that, it's not just I'm not just looking for it, but it's like I am seeking this almost it, with such a passion that it I want to worship it. I'm seeking this to worship is almost the idea of it. And so if we are going to leave the door of our home, right, and enter the world, what are we seeking? What are we directing? Um, are we looking for the flesh or are we looking for that linen that's, you know, representative of holiness? Um, are we able to live in the world, but not of the world? And so Dalit um, in that, that verse definitely has the idea of um, living a life of separation. And two, what were the priests to do? What, what are we to be holy, right? To be holy as I am holy Holy Kadesh means set apart, right? So we must be set apart and separated from um, all that we encounter in creation. So I thought um, that would be an interesting way to take a look at uh, that imagery behind that verse. So I'm just going to look at this. Sarita says, I love this one. This one hit home when we did the book study last year. Exactly. So Dalit. Dalit is the door. And I didn't, I don't have this in the book, but um, the word amen, the word amen in, he, um, in Hebrew is the same word as faith in Greek. So those two words are interchangeable. And if you do a word study on the word amen, it actually means the posts that hold up the door. So if we're going to go through that door, what's on the other side? Is it sin crouching at the door waiting to, to get us, right? Like Cain, when God said, you know, sin is crouching at the door, you know, is that beast going to devour us when we cross the door? Or are we understanding Jesus or Yeshua is our door? He says, I am the door. Um, are we going to walk through that with the understanding of our yes and amen, right? The, the faith that supports us um, and the priestly garments, right? Are we, what are we wearing? Are we mixing those fabrics or are we walking through the door of faith? Cause that's what that is. Um, you know, maintaining a holiness and think about too, you know, he's, uh, Yeshua says, I am the door. Um, in ancient times when, when the shepherd was, um, pastoring in an area, he would push his sheep into a cave. And then they would use rocks to block off the, the front and they would put thorns and thistles and they would go get branches and put that on top of the rocks so that the sheep wouldn't jump over it. And then they would sleep in front of any remaining opening or they, you know, they would be the door. So think about how that also relates to Yeshua. You know, when he said, I am the door, you know, he's the door to our sheep pen, right? And, and he knows us by name. But also he has that crown of thorns upon him so that, um, you know, it's it's definitely representing all aspects of the door. So and he keeps us in the fold. That's exactly right. So I, um, you know, I, I try to put examples of women in these stories so that if you were to meet them in the thick of it, you know, we often would not consider them as Proverbs 31 women. Um, yet when they experience a yoking to uh, Yeshua and they establish, um, he allows them to make the home, his home in their hearts. And we receive all the benefits of being believers, right? We, we are, we have spiritual gifts bestowed on us. We have all the benefits of having Abba Father. Um, that is a great benefit. And it's a, it's a, it's our gimel, right? That's, that's what lifts us up. 
but also um, we have an understanding of we are Kadesh. We are to be holy as he is holy and we are to live a life of separation. So I definitely wanted to bring those points up and and talk about how these ladies, because I have them in the story, as they experience this life changing word, you know, we we can definitely um, be Proverbs 31 women. Um, and, and again, consider how can I be a Proverbs 31 woman if I'm a widow, if I'm divorced, if I have no children, um, you know, by living a life of separation. And I'm not saying to live off by ourselves, but to, to have those boundaries and have that standard um, by being a benefit to others, by, um, you know, setting the tones in our home. You know, those are things we're going to do, whether we're married, single, or otherwise. Um, children, no children, grandchildren, or not. You know, those are all activities that we do within our home. So we keep the shalom in our home, correct? All right. And so the last one is um, Proverbs 31, 14. And I love this one. This one is, she is like a merchant's ship. She brings food from afar. So, okay, it starts with the letter hey, and hey is the one that has the, it's it's the square on top, but in the top left-hand corner, it's got that little window, okay? So guess what hey's picture is? It's a window. All right, well, how does that relate to a Proverbs 31 woman? All right, so let's go a little bit because we, we know that these letters not only have an image, but that image is just packed with pregnant, if you will, pregnant with all this additional figurative language. So I have a window here in front of me. And if I look out the window, I can tell that the wind is blowing, right? I can tell because I see the trees moving. And think about how merchant ships in ancient Israel, how did they travel? How did they get from port to port? Do they have an engine? Right? Did they have, uh, you know, rudders? Uh, yes. But how how were they pushed through the ocean? It was done by the sail, the wind pushing in the sail. And so hay often represents the Holy Spirit or the breath of God. So um, you know, I can't see the Holy Spirit, but I see the results of His work very similar to I'm looking out the window. I can't see the wind, but I see the results of its work. I see the trees moving. And so she is like a merchant ship. Basically, what propels her is what I would ask. What propels you? What is pushing you forward in your faith, in your life, in your struggles? How are you pushing through these storms in life if you want to keep you know, the idea of the sea, the Bible says that this, you know, don't be blown and tossed about by different doctrines and different messages that we, we need to, to anchor ourselves, if you will, to God's word, to his message, um, to all the benefits that he offers us. Uh, so we need to ask ourselves too, what propels us? What is pushing us? Is the breath of God pushing us forward? Or um, are we, you know, getting tossed by the oceans and storms of life? Um, hey is a letter, and this is so wonderful. Hey is a letter that um, it, we know that Hebrew doesn't have any vowels, right? And some letters are used as a vowel. Hey is kind of one of them. But also, hey is um, thought of as a word that was originally used by the ancient Israelites as the letter of identification. So think about this. We know that Abram and Sarah or Sari were called by God and sent, right? Propelled into, um, you know, they had to cross the desert and go into the promised land and, and to go where God sent them. But how did he identify, how did God, how did father identify them as his, right? How did they, how did they get marked as his. We know that they're the beginnings of God's chosen people, but how do we know? Well, um, he changed their name, right? And so he went from Abram to Abraham. So God added a, a hey. We went from Sarah to, or Sari to Sarah. He added a hey. And so the, 
the earliest name of God is Elim or El, right? And if you look that up in the Bible, in it's any God. Um, it could be any God. It's not a very, it's just a very generic name for God. Well, the Israelites God, our God is identified as Elohim and it's got the hay in it. And so it's the early linguistics believe that Elohim with the hay, the hay is the identifying marker of the God of the Israelites or, or God of the, the chosen people. And so when God changed Abram and Sari's name, he breathed, right? Right. Because it hay represents God's breath. And represents the Holy Spirit. And so God breathed into him this new calling that he gave them and the new identification. And also we know in Revelation, it says that, you know, there's a stone. We, ha we all have a white stone with a name that nobody knows other than um, God that has our name written on it. And I'm just wondering if it's got hay um, identified in it in some way. Um, and even in the New Testament, you know, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. We are, we have that mark. Think of the wax seals that were put over a letter. It's the identifying mark of a believer. And so what propels us? Are we being moved by the Holy Spirit? Or are we, um, you know, what is the mark that we're showing to the world as we begin to move? Um, and it also says, um, she, let's see if I can get the right one. Uh, she brings food from afar. Okay. Well, think about those ships that traveled port to port. And so she would go down to the harbor and, and go through the trade areas and find food that was brought from afar. So she was giving her family a great um, uh, choice, right? Great choices. All right, well, how does that apply to me? Does that mean I have to, you know, groceries are expensive now. How can I do that? Well, basically it's what is propelling you? How are you feeding your family, right? How are you feeding the kids? How are you feeding the grandkids? Are you feeding them junk food or are they feasting on the banquet that God has prepared for them? Because that is definitely food from afar. Um, you know, he, he is able to um, provide great food for us. Um, and so I, I want just to encourage you to check what is the food that we are feasting on? What are the food that you're feasting on? Um, are you feeding yourself with the word of God or are you feeding yourself with too much TV or, um, you know, mindless, like I've got so much to do. I'm just going to be mindless in how I get through things. Um, or are you feasting on, um, the important things in life. And so I, I just want to challenge you with that. Uh, you know, don't, uh, Bethlehem was called the house of bread. Um, however, if, if, you, if, if the Proverbs 31 woman uh, lived in the Judean hills, she didn't experience that bread, right? That's not where the bread was, you know, Israel has got this bountiful area of um, around Jerusalem, which would have been the house of bread. However, up in the hills, like you can't, you didn't have the agriculture that you do in the other areas. And so she would have been, um, she would have had to depend on uh, what came in the port and what she was able to trade for. And so there's a few things here and we'll get into it a little bit in, the, in another verse, but it tells you that she is definitely um, industrious, but also to leave the door to my home, I have to live a life of separation. How am I encountering others in the marketplace, right? And, and the marketplace for us could be anything, you know, are we working? How are we encountering people in the marketplace? How are we encountering people in the circles that we move in? Um, and are we feast, what are we feasting on? You know, are we, are we living that life of holiness and separation or are we uh, eating the junk food? Because it's simple, easy, quick, right? I'm, I'm the first one to admit junk food's easy. You just stick it in the microwave, right? Um, those of you that might make bread on Shabbat, it's a process. It takes time. Wouldn't it be easier just to go quick, quick and pick it up? Um, but uh, the, the Proverbs 31 woman understands that we can't be like the rest. We do have to have um, something that's different. And part of it is what propels us, what moves us forward in life. So 
those are the three. Um, I've got a few minutes if anybody has any questions, because then we'll stop the recording and then um, we open it up to questions and answers. And so um, we've got about four minutes before we turn that off. Think about any questions you have. If you would like me to go into deeper in any of these subjects, I certainly can. Um, I can tell you a little bit more about the ladies that I wrote about. Um, they're real people. <laughs> they're, they're real. Uh, so we can I can tell you how they're doing today. <laughs> I have a few that I have stayed in touch with and I can definitely give you like what's what's going on. So any any questions, comments or anything before we officially pause and begin the next session. OK. All right, Marion. Marion says, I'm so happy you're doing the study again. I missed it last year. Well, welcome. Yep. And we just started. So you haven't missed hardly anything at all. Uh, the book is available through Amazon. I think Rooted Cafe also has a link to it in their resource page. Um, and I have it on my website. I can ship it to you as well directly. So uh, if you would like a copy of it, I have it for you. Okay. All right. Well, Ruth, do you want to go ahead and pause the recording? And then um, I think they want us to stop it at 30 minutes and then we'll sit in the back of every chapter. There you go. Um, I was okay. going to say, I have questions at the back of every chapter. And so I, I can ask you those questions if you guys want to unmute and talk to me, or if you want to type in answers, um, totally up to you. I, you know, whatever you guys feel comfortable about. Verse 14, window, I'm just reading the comments real quick. Hey, hey, is behold, it is, be it is behold, yeah. Yep, um, so this is totally on the side, but um, I'm trying to see who wrote this. Ruth, Ruth wrote in yud hey vav hey, right? Hand behold, window behold, or um, hand behold, nail behold is actually what Yahweh, if you look at the imagery of the word Yahweh, it's hand, behold, nail, which is Vav, behold. Um, and so, you know, another identification and think about the breath, right? We talked about how um, God changed Abram and Sari's name by breathing into them. Um, but hey is said with no noise. It's just the breath. It's just, it's just a breath. There's no guttural sound. And so think about Yahweh, um, and I do put this in the book, you know, everything, every word that we speak, every breath that we take speaks God's name. So what identifies us as his, yes, we have hey breathing over us, but we repeat that to him every time we say the word Yahweh. So I'll, I'll pause for a second, say it like Yah is in way. I mean, you say that truly. We we add the guttural sound because you know we're we're speaking. But if you're in a time of prayer, you know we're we're breathing His name every time we say Yahweh. So I love it, and that's hey, that's definitely hey. Okay, all right. So what questions do we have, you guys? I'm, I'm going to need your help, <laughs> and and if I don't get it, then I'm asking you questions. So I, can you hear me, sis? I don't really have a question. It's more like a comment, I guess. For me, the reflective question about, um, you know, even when you mentioned, you know, how are you feeding your families? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, as a homeschooling mom, I like, I, I love that you said um, um, to feast, right, on his work, yeah. feast on, yeah. his, on, on the good things, right, on, on right. the holy things. And I think that what that's what, living a life of separation really is um, to be intentional mm -hmm. and I just think I don't know this is good accountability for me and good reminders because um you know we're coming to a close with our homeschooling season right and I'm just like oh man I just hope they were fed on the weightier things you know and yeah. and, and yes I I like I'm like I don't know academically I feel like oh we need to make up for some stuff but I feel like the important thing is, you know, nourishing them and and, and their identity and who they are and what the father, you know, wants them to become. Yeah. Think about it too. You know, even Yeshua quotes, man cannot live on bread alone. 
And so, you know, it says she brings food from afar. The word in there is, is lechem, it's bread, right? But we can't feast on bread alone. We must feast on everything that comes from the word of God. And so, um, you know, it's the whole idea of feasting on his word and feasting on um, everything that comes from him and acknowledging the blessings of him. So I think that there's definitely um, some, some, you know, meat, <laughs> if you will, packed into the idea of bread. Um, I'm going to just kind of look at some questions in the in the back of every chapter. I do um, include some chapters and I do apologize. My, I, know, I hear my dogs barking. I don't know if you can, but um, I hope they're not terribly distracting for you guys. But uh, in the in the last um, chapter of Gimel, um, you know, I, I have some questions for you just to kind of ponder and consider. Um, you know, for whom do you have a spiritual burden? Because Gimel is a beast of burden. And so what burdens are you carrying? What burdens are you carrying that require the uplifting support of God? And so, you know, camels have to kneel and they have to be unloaded before they can be reloaded. And so think about how we as wives and moms and women um, we carry a lot, right? We And we tend to even carry the burdens of other people. They're not even our burdens, but we're going to carry them for them. And so we need to kneel down. We need to kneel and allow Father to unload those burdens and to, you know, and to refill us with the supplies that we need. If we're going to go through the deserts with someone else, then he's going to have to pile the supplies on us. And so uh, something to consider, you know, we cannot minister from an empty cup. So we definitely have to um, reload, if you will, with uh, the qualities and the, the benefits that we can extend to others. Um, so, and, and here's a kind of question that goes with that. At what times in your life have you seen the value of being on your knees before God? And so, you know, those, those camels kneel, right? And so we, we can take the imagery of kneeling and, and falling on our knees before God um, and understanding the true value of that. And um, you know, I kind of, I know I mentioned this, but who better to unload, right? Because we carry a lot and we don't want to unload to our friends. We don't necessarily run to the phone and unload, you know, on the phone with somebody, even unloading with our husband on some things. You know, there might be things that, um, you know, that unloading process can get kind of ugly. And so why not fall on your knees and allow um, that burden to be lifted by our father? Uh, the gimel often represents the idea of loving kindness, right? And so what does God's loving kindness look like in your life? What benefits have you received from him, right? We've got gamal, G-I-M-A-L, gamal, which is just like gimel, G-I-M-E-L, right? It's just the way you pronounce it. It's different. And so how does Abba comfort you? How does Abba um, bestow on you loving kindness. That that's that's gimel. That's the gimel. Um, and also, what benefits do you offer your family? You know, we often don't even pause. It says that she is a benefit. Think about it. Take a few minutes, you guys, and think about. It's not vain, right? It's not being proud to say, you know, I am a benefit to my family. I. Um, have taught my kids the routines of life. I have taught them responsibility. I have taught them consequences. You know, those are benefits in life. And it, I don't think it's being proud uh, to list the benefits of being a daughter of the king, right? To have Abba instruct us on how we can be benefits to our family. So... How are you guys a benefit? I'll pause there and I'll see if anybody jumps on and says, how are you a benefit to your family? All right. Yep, definitely homemaking. Definitely. You guys set the tone in your homes. Yep. And that's true. I, I'm willing to bet if you ask your husband, how, how did I benefit you today? They may not like off the top of their head think, oh, you did this, this. You benefited because 
You've kept the house clean. Dinner is ready for them. They are able to be the men that God has placed them to be in this world because they have the benefit of a wife that is taking care of them. Definitely an organizer. That's a benefit. That's a huge benefit. Definitely. All right. So Dalit was the door. And that's the idea of separation, living a life of separation. So here's the question that goes with that. Um, as you walk in this world, will you be identified as set apart or do you simply blend in? So that's that's kind of a ooh. And I probably should look at that in almost everything that I do, right? Anytime I leave the house, do I blend in or am I living a life that is set apart? Uh, this is a good question. Describe a time when you opened the door of your heart to someone quite unlike you. How are we able to introduce and be that bridge? How are we going to be that gimmel? Well, we might have to open the door to our hearts uh, to accept some things that uh, we probably wouldn't pick for us, but um, our father definitely has a better understanding of the needs that we have in our lives. Okay, and then this is the question, and I, I am sure you guys have prayed this. This is a good one. When dealing with something big, we often pray, Father, open or close a certain door. How many times have you guys said, Father, if this is your will, then open this door. Or Father, if this is not your will, close that door. I know you have. <laughs> but do we live in such a way that we can recognize unlikely doors? Right? How, like, if we're saying, just show me the door, do you live in such a way that you would recognize a door or are you going to walk on by that door thinking that surely that is not the door that would, you know, be available to me? I, I was sharing with Ruth earlier, you know, I'm looking, I'm looking for a job. I'm, I think I need to go back to work. Um, and I'm a public school teacher and I really want to go back to my district like that's where I want to work I want to go back to the school I was in I'm like God please open the door I want that but it now it, it's still going to be several months before I can finally start applying for a job and so in this time period he has changed my heart and so now my heart is father I will take anything you give me as long as I know I'm in where I'm where I'm supposed to be according to your will right so my prayers have changed from open this door, you know, this is the only place I want to work to, I'll work anywhere you tell me, I'll just, I'll do what you tell me to do. So sometimes those doors, um, we're looking for a certain welcoming, a welcome reef and a welcome mat, and we're uh, walking by some of the other doors. Yeah, definitely have to surrender it. Okay, um, and then how willing how can you willingly live a life of holiness knowing that it might, dread? and this is going to be a touchy one, how can you willingly live a life of holiness knowing that it might drive a wedge into a relationship with a friend, a family member, or a coworker? And I think this one definitely is hard, especially in this community, because we are Torah observant or we are Hebrew inclined um, you know, we are getting ready to celebrate Passover and the other believers in our life are celebrating Easter, you know, and not, I'm not judging that, you know, but can I, can I invite them to Passover or is it going to drive that wedge? Correct. You know, we, we want to be that opportunity um, for them to experience Abba in a way that they've never experienced it. You know, but we have to understand that, you know, keep that door open so that we're not driving a wedge, right? We don't want to, we don't want to burn the bridges. We want to open the bridges. So yeah, it's definitely, um, it's hard. We ha and, and we have to be accepting, you know, that whole love the sinner, but not the sin attitude. Um, how do you walk that out? How do we do that? And yet still have the boundaries of holiness because, um, you know, we're not supposed to mix. We're not supposed to mix the fibers. Yeah, be the bridge. Okay. I'm reading comments and everything. So um, uh, Miriam is just saying that, you know, her, her sister is a lesbian, yet she approaches her very differently and it shocks her sister because she knows how she, like Miriam is still able to have that standard and and have those boundaries, but yet she can still love her sister, right? You know, so we're definitely um, 
opening doors that are different uh, and how people walk through them. We, we, can, we can help them walk through those doors. Uh, okay, the last one is hey. Yeah, it, it is good to have, I'm reading comments. It's good to have healthy boundaries. It is, and we have to. You know, like I'm not gonna, you know, be accepting of everything my kids do. Some of the stuff is pretty bad, <laughs> yet I still love my kids, right? My home is still open to them um, and I can still teach them and I can still share uh, my beliefs and um, in a non-threatening way. That's not, um, I'm, I'm, my job is not to shame them or to convict them. I'm going to let the Holy Spirit, I'm going to let hay breathe life into them in a different way. Okay, so here is hay. This is the last chapter. Um, it says, society's definition of sin constantly changes. What behavior is acceptable today that even a few years ago would have been called sin. So, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to get too political or too, uh, you know, thinking through uh, things that we're encountering on the news today, but there are things, um, you know, as a, as a high school, I teach seniors, right? High school senior English teacher. I overhear these kids talking about things. And when I'm like, that's not okay. You know, they think it's perfectly okay. Um, they think I'm a prude, right, to, to think otherwise. And so think about how society, um, we can't depend on others to define the goodness of God and what is acceptable. We must know what the word is. We must know um, his truth. You know, there's a great phrase that pops around, you know, you, you have your truth or you know, own your truth. Well, the problem with that is it's not truth. It's not truth as it aligns to God's word. Um, I can't have my own truth. I have to follow Abba Father, right? I have to follow his truth. Definitely. Okay. Um, how does society's acceptance of sin affect your family, right? Sometimes it's hard to deal with um family and you know other family members may accept something and but yet you see it as a sin and again how how we approach that and how we approach that relationship can be the difference between being a bridge or, or driving a wedge so um this is good and I, I put this in how do you filter what society has to offer before it comes into your home so this is the thinking of she goes she brings food from afar um, and think about a window in ancient Near East time, right? It was the, they were lattices, they were crisscrossed windows. And so the windows acted as a filter, right? It kept people from climbing in your window. It kept animals from com coming into your, into your home. And think of on um, ships, right? It kept that lattice window um, to to prevent the sea spray from coming in and from, you know, animals and people falling out of the boats. And, you know, it was a way to kind of be, act as a filter or a sieve. And so if you're bringing food from afar, what are you bringing into your home? And are you filtering it through that door, right? Um, in ancient times, uh, when we had the, the tabernacle and we had the temple, there was a position called the doorkeeper and the person's job was you know, keeping the riffraff out, right? Um, it was kind of like a bouncer, I guess, if you want to think of it that way. And so, and there are actually two, I think two um, references in the Bible that the doorkeeper, um, there were women who acted as the doorkeeper. So here's interesting when um, Yeshua was, uh, uh, taken away and arrested and Peter was warming his hands by the fire and um, you know right before you hear the cock crow he's confronted by a woman and she's like aren't you one of his followers it, and in the verses it talks about how she is a doorkeeper she knew he was one of the followers because she saw him at the temple with Jesus and so um, you know are are we filtering what comes through our doors. We are acting as the doorkeeper. I'm reading, Ruth is saying watchman and a watch maiden. Yeah, and we'll talk about the watchman on the wall later. Well, we'll get to that, um, how we act as a watchman for our family. So, but we should be the doorkeepers. We should be, we should be the filter before anything comes into our home. It should be filtered through us 
as we filter it through um, what, what is allowable in the word of God. So, all right, and I think I have one more question. Um, okay, here we go. This is, we talked about this. Uh, when the doctor listens to your lungs with a stethoscope, he asks us to take a deep breath. Okay, everybody do that now. Everybody pause for a second. Take a deep breath. Okay, and exhale. Did you hear it? Did you say Yahweh? How does it feel to know that every breath that sustains your life also speaks the holy name of God. Every breath, every breath you take speaks the name of God. Um, in our earlier coffee chat, Sarita and Ruth and I were talking a little bit about just the different names like, you know, Yeshua versus Jesus or, um, you know, God the Father and Jesus, you know, just the different names that people say for the, for the name of God. And um, you know what? We can set all of that aside because just taking a breath of life speaks the name of God. So that, and that's, so I had told Sarita, um, you know, when I pray, when I am like really on my face in prayer, I don't really specifically cry out to a name, but I breathe his presence. And so that's one way we can um, breathe the name of God. So I'm reading through Diane Clark says um, how to be a doorkeeper and a bridge at the same time. Yeah, it's hard, especially with teenage children. Amen, sister. <laughs> Amen. Um, yeah, I, I, my kids are my youngest is 21. So and she's fully embracing the life of a 21 year old. If you get my drift, um, she doesn't live with me. Um, she she's she has her own apartment. But, um, you know, she's welcome in my home and I love her and I want her to come home as often as she can. But um, some of the crazy that she embraces as a 21 year old, like I, I don't can't really relate to it. And she knows that, you know, and I'll tell her, you know, you know, I probably don't really want to know what you did at the club last week. <laughs> um, it's OK. We can talk about some other things. <laughs> <laughs> right? So I'm trying to keep that, I'm keeping the doors open, that I'm acting as a bridge because she still knows my boundaries. Um, but yet she understands that she's welcome and loved. All right. I have done all the talking in this Q&A section. Any questions you guys have? Any comments? <laughs> okay. Okay. All right, well, the next section, um, like I said, there are um, chunks of information in this passage. So we have established a home, right? They're yoked together. They've created a home. She has a benefit, and then she has to go out the door, and how does she interact with the world? Um, how does she provide for her family? So all of these first couple of verses is establishment of that home. The next couple of verses, um, we're going to talk about Vav. Let me just kind of look at my notes real quick. Vav. And then we talk about um, Zion and Chet. So those will be the three verses that we do next time. And we're actually taking a little bit of a shift. We're going to start looking at um, spiritual warfare, right? Uh, Zion is a sword. How does that work with us in, in Proverbs 31, right? right? I thought I was a peacemaker. What are you talking about? I have to carry a sword. Uh, Vav is a nail. What are we attaching ourselves to? Uh, and Chet is, is, the, is a fence, um, you know, the kind of the boundaries and the refuge. And so we'll talk a wall, if you will. We'll talk a little bit about a wall. So, um, those are kind of the ideas that, that are coming. So you can get a little bit of a spoiler alert for that. Um, but so once we've established our home and we've determined how we're going to interact in this world, we have to be aware that we are going to face some spiritual battle. And um, if, if you're looking at Proverbs 31, one of the themes is a military theme. And so how do her military actions show up in this verse.
Okay, and then I'm going to challenge you too. How does Yeshua show up in these verses, right? Yeshua is our bridge, right? He is the door. He is, um, he is the breath. He is the truth that comes from the father's mouth. Um, you know, it, how, how can I interact in the world to rep, to best represent him? If I don't have a husband here on earth, how can I best represent my bridegroom, Yeshua, through these passages? Because that's what the Proverbs 31 wife does, that or the Proverbs 31 woman does. She works to bring honor to her husband at the city gates. That's the that's the main idea of this entire passage. And so the city gates is the area of life. How do I live in such a way that I am making his name known, that, that he is getting the respect that he deserves at the city gates of my life, right? Okay. All right. I'm just going to look at our comments real quick. I don't know if we have any other. We've got about eight minutes. I don't really, I don't, I don't want to end too soon if you guys have a question or anything. So which chapters am I covering next week? Miriam asked that. I am going to look at, um, let me look real quick. So Proverbs 31, 15, 16, and 17. So what chapters are those? It is the um, Vav, where it says she's attached to Christ. That's the fifth, that's Proverbs 31, 15. Proverbs 31, 16 is um, she wields the word of God. That's 16. That's the one where it talks about she plants a vineyard with her gains. And then the next one is she prays for a hedge of protection. And that's het, because het is a fence or a wall or a hedge. And that's Proverbs 31, 17. So those are the three chapters. So if you guys don't have the book or if you're just picking up the book, basically um, for next month, if you want to read pages one through 74, those are all the verse, those are all the pages that we've covered so far, one through 74. And this is the name of the book. And it is available all over the place. <laughs> There you go, pages one through 74. That, yep, so, um, and actually, if you want to go ahead and read the Het chapter, I'll, I'll extend that just a tiny bit. We'll say one through 84, because if you read the next 10 pages, that'll get you exactly where we're covering next week. So one through 84 gives you everything, perfect. Everything that we um, will be talking about through next week. So there you go. All right. Any comments or questions, you guys? I think I've got you up to speed. Okay. All right. I'm going to pause just for a second. I just want to make sure I didn't miss anybody's questions. Okay. Let me go back through the questions. All right. Okay. Well, thank you guys. Um, we'll come back next month, um, and I, I'm trying to do about three. Is this too much? I guess I could ask you that. Is three okay, or is it too much information too quick? Do I need to go slower? Because I'm hoping most of you guys are reading the book as well. And I'm not, get, I'm not getting a ton of detail into the book, right? I don't want to. Okay, three is okay. Yeah. If I go down to two, then I'm going to, like, talk a little bit more of what's in the book and that's for you guys to read <laughs> yeah it's just a summary exactly it's just a summary okay um wait sis did you want to touch up on anyone um i know you wanted to with the ladies you included in your book oh um maybe just the one on this chapter for which for one me. for the merchant ship i'm really i guess oh, her name is um joy so the person that I wrote about in that book um, for the merchant ship is Joy. And Joy's um, story is kind of interesting because she actually married someone. And, and so this book is definitely for the Christian audience. So I, I use Jesus and I go back and forth to a lot of issues, you know, in the church. So I'm trying to be the bridge between 
the Christians going a little bit deeper into word study and understanding the Hebrew. So Joy grew up in church, right? And attended youth and had a, a boyfriend in her youth group for, I think, four years. They dated four years before they got married. And on her honeymoon, she realized the mistake she made in marrying him because he, what he portrayed at church was completely different than what she experienced um, even as early as their honeymoon. And so he was very abusive and controlling. She stuck in there. She did not want, like, she didn't want to get a divorce. Like, she made this commitment. Um, but ultimately, it got to the point where she could not. And so she very much understood the idea of surrender. And I used the analogy of, like, the ship being tossed through a seas, right? And she felt like she was drowning and how she definitely focused on her relationship with Yeshua almost to the point where, um, you know, like her kids, she, she encouraged her kids to, uh, you know, strip away anything that would be a distracting to them. Like she, we, we turned off TV. We did not sign up for all the activities. Like we just spent time loving on each other and understanding um, the provisions of God and how he can provide for us. And when, um, as a single mom, you know, she financially didn't have a lot going on to offer her kids. They barely made it. And her daughter came to her one time and was like, um, you know, mom, I'd really like this certain pair of shoes. And she's like, kind of almost as a joke. She's like, all right, well, let's pray for them. Well, sure enough, then her daughter goes garage sailing with her with her friend and they find that exact pair of shoes. So she was able to use that as an opportunity to show how Abba is our father, right? He loves us. He protects us. He's going to provide for us. And we may not understand every way of how he can provide for us, but do we have that trust in bringing all of our needs to him? Um and, and what are we anchoring ourselves to so that we're not tossed around? So that's um, that's Joy. She actually did remarry in the story. We do talk about how she remarried and she actually married a pastor. And so, and he adopted her children. Um, her first husband not only rejected her, completely rejected the children as well. And so her new husband even adopted the children. Um, and so... Just fun, fun stories. There's even a story in there. She asked her, she had a little boy. He was young, five, I think. And she said, you know, are you help? Are you helping mom pray for the new house we can look for? And he said, actually, mom, I'm praying for a creek because I love catching frogs. And unbeknownst to him, she had actually looked at a piece of property earlier in the day that had a creek in the backyard. That, And she said, isn't it just like um, Abba? Isn't it just like our heavenly father? to answer the prayer, the simple prayers, even of a little boy who just wants to chase frogs, right? He he loves us so much. He'll even give us that um, and bless our kids. So that was the story of her being propelled, her being moved by the Holy Spirit. So, and I think we have hit. Yeah, I've lost things. That's exactly right. I do too, my, especially my car keys. <laughs> You had a frog, you had a dream for a frog. I hope they were good frogs. <laughs> uh, Passover is definitely upon us. Yes, it is. <laughs> I agree. Well, ladies, it's 2.30 and thank you for joining me. I hope it wasn't too fast. Come next week with some questions. I definitely want to uh, hear your questions and comments on the book um, and, and make a chat, join the chat on band. Like you guys can message, I'm on band. You can message me. I would love, love, love to hear from you. So thank you for joining us today and I'll see you guys next time. <laughs>